Thank you. Um, so today I want to talk um, about um, an extraordinary Englishman, um, um, an extraordinary Protestant, uh, and an extraordinary man in the history of 17th century Ireland in the sense that he bridged uh, communities, he bridged linguistic divisions, he bridged um, cultural divisions. And I'm going to talk about uh, a man called William Beadle, who's quite an extraordinary, uh, and also a, a, a cosmopolitan in a way which I think is very attractive to, to an audience today. But first I want to say a little bit about um, um, the Reformation in Ireland, and I want to talk a little bit about print, because two revolutions complement each other in the early modern world. So the early modern world is the 16th, 17th, and into the 18th centuries. You've got two great revolutions which, um, which, um, which complement each other, but also are driven by a, a, a mutually um, shared uh, dynamic. Let's perhaps um, have a look at the question of um, the Reformation in Ireland first, um, um, a, a deeply contested episode. Um, in 1620, a, a Cork Old English emigre called John Coppinger, about whom we know very little, uh, commented somewhat ironically on how during the first phase of the Reformation in Ireland uh, under um, uh, Elizabeth, um, the English Bible and the English Common Prayer Book, so the Common Prayer Book, the, the central liturgical uh, text of Anglicanism, how they'd been distributed um, throughout the country in churches where people could not speak or understand the English tongue. And he said, ironically, now during the reign of uh, King James I, successor to uh, Elizabeth, now in the king's reign, you cause these books to be set forth in the Irish tongue, compelling every parish church to pay 10 shillings for an Irish Bible, when one amongst 100 cannot read them or understand them. So um, um, there's, this, there's this ambiguous attitude to evangelization in the vernacular on the part of the Church of, church of Ireland. Um, I, I want to touch here on some of the issues which pertain to that ambiguity, but also to questions of literacy and print. And he says now, and let's, let's touch on the linguistic reality of early modern Ireland. Coppinger says, are not for the most part all the benefices and church livings of that kingdom bestowed upon English and Scottish ministers, not one of them having three words of the Irish tongue. And although in the English pale and in poor towns, the inhabitants, especially the best sort, can speak English. Yet few of the common sort, except it be betwixt Dublin and Drogheda, and three baronies in the county of Wexford can speak any word of English. So there's this linguistic reality which has to be faced in early modern Ireland by, uh, by the church, uh, by evangelical Protestants. And that's the linguistic reality, the fact the majority of the population spoke the Irish language. Uh, and literacy, as it was in other European languages at this period, was restricted to an elite. So you've got two great challenges there, literacy, but in the Irish context, you've got the, the challenge of evangelization in the... Uh... Sorry, Mark, I think I maybe muted you by mistake. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think you might have. Yeah, sorry. Um, so there's a great cultural clash, um, a linguistic clash and a religious uh, clash. And, and we get some sense of perhaps the, the, the sense of alienation uh, on the part of the Gaelic uh, intellectual elite in a poem composed in the mid 1650s by a man called Sean O'Connell. Uh, it's called The Lament for, for, for Ireland. But what he says is, is extremely interesting and it, it illustrates a sense of cultural alienation from the Reformation. And I think the sense of native Irish cultural alienation is something that we need to attend to and perhaps we might touch on during the course of uh, this talk. He talks about how um, the Humpiach and Bible or Latin compare. He talks about how the Bible was translated uh, from Latin to English. He talks about the need act gone afrom the age took the legislation has been introduced to, to ban the mass. And he says, interestingly, it's both Pubble and the Saxon, English people, but also the Gaelic Irish who are beginning to, to abandon their faith and their uh, belief. Um, so there is, there is, there is, there's an ambiguity in this, in this cultural and religious encounter. Another um, perhaps later commentary, which is worth uh, bearing in mind, uh, comes from Arthur Annesley. And he was a Dublin born Protestant, sat for Dublin in Richard Cromwell's parliament early in 1659, held a series of important administrative posts. And he says something very interesting, I think, again, which kind of bookends, I suppose, this, this complicated and ambiguous process of putative, of putative, of aspirational evangelization. To the disgrace of Christianity, which the Roman Catholics profess, and the dishonor of the English, 
They had succeeded better in their plantations among the heathen Indians in America than among the Irish and Old English corrupted by the Irish, who after so many hundred years are not reclaimed when many of the Indians turn Christians and the rest brought to such order and civility that they live peacefully by the English planters without attempts at massacres which they barbarously committed in Ireland. Uh, well, that's not an, alto, an altogether uh, accurate statement, but he's referring here, I suppose, to 1641. So what we see here is religion and culture going hand in hand. Whilst uh, some success has, uh, has been uh, had in terms of evangelizing um, Native Americans, Indigenous Americans in New England, for instance, um, their evangelization also entailed a process of cultural accommodation. So not only are they brought to a Protestant version of Christianity, but they are brought to um, such order and civility that they live peacefully by the English planters. So Reformation from an English perspective is also a question of cultural accommodation to notions of um, English uh, civility. I'll give you a very brief introduction. I'm conscious of time and I need to cover a lot of territory today, but just a very brief introduction. Uh, to understand the Protestant Bible in Irish, we need to know a little about uh, the Reformation in Ireland and its, and its uh, slow and, and somewhat troubled um, uh, course of progress. Um, as is well known, um, the recognition of Henry VIII as head of the church in England in uh, 1534 um, drove uh, the English uh, Reformation fundamentally. An equivalent Irish Act of Supremacy was introduced in 1536 uh, and uh, Henry was recognised as the head of the church in Ireland. The arrival of the um, Englishman George Brown in 1536 um, was, was really the beginning, the, the, the first dynamic in terms of driving an Irish Reformation. And the fact that an Englishman is introduced, I think underpins this, um, this, this, this problematic that besets the Reformation in Ireland, that this, this lack of, 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 if you want to put it in, in inverted commas, native, um, uh, native um, connection. 1537, the first phase of uh, monastic dissolutions begins in Ireland. In 1549, the English Act of Uniformity uh, ordered that the Book of Common Prayer would replace all Catholic liturgical books. Now, something very significant happens in Dublin, uh, something that's not much remarked upon uh, by historians, uh, and that is that the first book was printed in Dublin in 1551. Um, quite a late development in a European context, but nonetheless, uh, it's illustrative of the, of, of, of the Reformation, of, of Protestant uh, reform efforts, and how closely linked they were to the printed word. But as we know, Catholicism remained strong in Ireland uh, during Edward VI Reformation, um, uh, under uh, Queen Mary, um, um, there, there are efforts to, to, to restore um, Catholic uh, worship. Um, but by 1567, there is a recognition, I suppose, that um, a greater effort needs to be made to engage with the native population, with the Irish Gaelic population, with the majority uh, linguistic and cultural uh, population in Ireland. But slow, uh, slow was the progress and tortuous was the progress. In 1567, Adam Loftus, then Archbishop of Armagh, and uh, Hugh Brady, an Irish speaker, Bishop of Mead, were asked to repay 66 uh, pounds, 12 shilling and four pence, which had been paid by Elizabeth, who was notoriously parsimonious and not keen uh, to, 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 to spend where she could possibly avoid it. But they obviously had been commissioned, we don't know the full details, to provide for an Irish translation of the New Testament and, and hadn't delivered the, uh, delivered the goods. Elizabeth, though, was to, to, uh, was to be reminded of this fundamental failure. Uh, provision of the vernacular is, is a fundamental precept of, of, of the Protestant Reformation. People must be able to, to worship God in a language they understand. They must be able to access the uh, scriptures. This is the key. This is essential um, to, to, uh, to uh, Protestant reform efforts across Europe. Uh, in 1575, Elizabeth was in progress in Woodstock, a village outside Oxford, where she was admonished by the influential Lawrence Humphrey. Now, he was the Puritan president of Magdalen College, Oxford, and he admonished her over a failure to provide a Gaelic Bible. So um, there is this uh, absence, this, this fundamental uh, absence in terms of, uh, of, of uh, Protestant reform efforts in Ireland and, and this, this failure to date to provide the scriptures in the Irish language. So let's talk a little bit about the printing revolution uh, and it's a new era in communication I mean, it's, uh, it's often said we're living through and I suppose we are we're living through an era uh, of, of accelerated change uh, in communications with the advent of social media. But if we cast our minds back to early modern Europe 
uh, something quite similar is happening in terms of the introduction of, of print and, and how print opens up a whole new um, realm of communication. Uh, in the 1450s, Gutenberg's uh, transformative new technology of print, move, movable type, um, really um, launches a revolution um, which, which, um, which, is, uh, which is transformative in cultural terms, but is also key, it seems to me, to the progress of uh, Protestant uh, reform efforts. Symbolically, emblematically, uh, Gutenberg's first printed uh, Bible was sold out at the Frankfurt Fair in 1454. Now, print spread rapidly from Mainz in Germany through the cities of the German Empire, places like Augsburg, Nuremberg, Basel, they all emerge as major print centres. So they're all um, wealthy urban centres too, and I think that's important to bear in mind. Print goes southwards beyond the Alps to, to, uh, to, uh, to Italy, to the, the city-states, to Rome, Venice, Venice emerges as this extraordinarily cosmopolitan center of print, and this will be important. We need to remember Venice because um, Beadle spends some time in Venice, and that's where I think he uh, develops a very interesting cultural capacity, a cultural empathy, which embraces different languages, different viewpoints. Print spreads like wildfire. It spreads to, to, Fr uh, to France, to Paris, uh, Lyon, the Low Countries. Um, it's a little bit uh, slow in arriving in England, but William Caxton is, is printing at Westminster by 1476. And of course, it goes eastwards to um, the territories of Poland and Bohemia. So by 1490, um, there are over 200 printing presses in cities across Europe. So it's very much an urban phenomenon. Um, and it's, 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 it's an industry. And, and like all industries, it requires capital. It requires money to invest. There's a technology entailed on this. And it also requires return on capital. So um, when entrepreneurs put money into something, they wish to make a profit. And where best uh, to make a profit? But in university cities. So where you have a, a demand on the part perhaps of uh, clergy, clerics, but also university students and professionals like lawyers and, and doctors. But I suppose we need to see print as, as part of a, an ecology of, of a communication. Uh, print doesn't replace manuscripts immediately. Manuscripts can continue to be written. And the world remains a verbal place, uh, as it does to, um, to, uh, to today. So if we think about our current uh, print, uh, if we think about our current uh, communications revolutions, okay, we're online, we're Zooming and all that, but we're still using pen and paper. Uh, we're still reading, we're still talking. So uh, there's an ecology of communications there, which I think is important and which we need to bear in mind when we think about efforts to evangelize. Uh, to bring people over to Protestant Reformation, and of course, efforts to, to retard that process um, through the Catholic Counter-Reformation. But it's um, maybe worth uh, reflecting on what the um, um, great book historian, um, recently retired uh, librarian of Harvard said, um, Robert Danton, historian of 18th century France, and he tells us that for the common people in early modern Europe, so the, the period that we're concerned with, a reading was a social activity. It took place in workshops, barns, and taverns. It was almost always oral, but not necessarily edifying. So um, people are listening as much as they're actually reading. Okay, so it's a much more communally focused uh, activity than we might uh, conceive it as. He says throughout much of Western his history, and especially in the 16th and 17th centuries, reading was seen above all as a spiritual exercise. Um, so reading is very closely aligned to questions of belief, questions of, uh, of devotional practice, questions of religion. Let's now begin our, our potted and, and very, very quick busman's tour of print in the Irish uh, language or the Gaelic language. Uh, the first book in the Irish language was, wasn't actually printed in Ireland. It was printed in Edinburgh. Uh, in, um, in 1567, so it's, uh, it's Gaelic, Irish, um, um, depending on how you wish to define the language used, but it's a book that would have been um, easily read in, in both territories, both Gaelic dominions uh, by the literate. A man called uh, John Carswell, who was a superintendent of Argyll and Bishop of the Isles, translated to Gaelic the Book of Common Order, uh, and this was a revised version, uh, eff effectively, of the Geneva book, also called John Knox's Liturgy, John Knox being the, the great Scottish Calvinist reformer. So Furm Nenurni was printed in Edinburgh by a man called Robert Lechprevik in uh, 1567, 1567, dedicated to the Earl of Argyll, a, a, a strong uh, proponent of uh, Protestant reform efforts. 
And it's essentially a short version of Calvin's catechism. There's an epistle to the reader, there's an address to the reader, there's a bardic poem, interestingly. We'll come back to this, this question of the manifestation of, 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 of Gaelic cultural activity or of elite Gaelic cultural activity. So there's a bardic poem addressed to the book, and as you might expect uh, in, 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 a, for, in, a, in, a, in a text from, um, from uh, in this part of the world, there was a formula for blessing a boat, a, a metrical version of the Lord's Prayer. If you look at the rather battered copy there that remains in the, uh, the British Library in London, you'll see that it's printed in Roman type. So um, that's something that, um, that's interesting because books in Scottish Gaelic continue to be printed in this type. Uh, unlike books in the Irish language, for, which are printed in the Gaelic script, which was essentially a, a, how manuscripts, the form of lettering used for, for writing manuscripts in the Irish language. And I, I think um, there's something quite symbolic about the, this difference, but also something quite uh, culturally important about the invocation of, of a Gaelic um, script, uh, which I think argues for authenticity, it argues for a, 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 an antique cultural lineage. And let's now come to the first book in the Irish language printed in Ireland. And it was printed by a man called Sean O'Carne. And there's a very interesting early cohort of Gaelic Irishmen who become Protestant and who are educated in Cambridge. And, and that, would, that would tend to, it seems to me, to, um, to refute this, this, this assumption that perhaps there were no native Irish Protestants. Indeed, there were native Irish Protestants in the first phase of Reformation. So there was a moment, it seems, when the efforts at Protestant Reformation were not wholly um, indifferent to Gaelic cultural integrity. There was a moment where Gaelic Irishmen from elite enough backgrounds were comfortable with the process of Reformation. And I think, I would argue, were also anxious to secure a, a Gaelic style, a Gaelic, uh, a Gaelic cultural element to um, the Protestant Reformation in Ireland. So I think we need to be careful to not to assume that there is this, uh, this inevitability about the failure of the Protestant Reformation in Ireland and an inevitability about um, uh, a failure to, to vanquish Catholicism, as, as might have been the viewpoint of, of Protestant reformers. So um, there's no inevitability. Um, there are moments of ambiguity and openness. Let's, um, let, we don't know a huge amount about Sean O'Carna. He was born uh, in County Sligo. He must have been a native speaker of Irish. Where did he learn to speak English? He was educated at Magdalen College in Cambridge. He matriculated there, came back to um, Dublin, um, became treasurer of St. Patrick's Cathedral, which was a staunch stronghold of old English Catholicism in Ireland. Okay, it was a place where the old English had a very strong uh, sense of... Uh, uh, of identity, a, st a strong sense of identification with their history in Ireland. Uh, you can see here that in this uh, very um, short uh, catechism that he uses a, a Gaelic style alphabet. It's a translation uh, of the text of the catechism from uh, the 1559 version of the Book of Common Prayer. It also includes a translation of a, of a proclamation on the tenets of religion issued by Lord Deputy uh, Sidney in Dublin, 1566. So immediately there's this linking of the Reformation with English authority in Ireland. We find an expression of English authority in Ireland, unusually here in a Gaelic guise. Who printed it? Um, a printing is a technology. Printing simply can't be undertaken at a moment's notice. You need, you need trained uh, and skilled craftsmen to undertake a, a printing press, to oversee the printing press, to set the type. Uh, where does the paper come from? Paper uh, is, is imported into, into Britain and Ireland in this period. It comes from France, Italy, and so on. Um, it requires capital. It requires a, a layout. It, it, it requires a logistical, um, um, it requires logistical support. So who printed it? Well, we know of, um, only two printers, it seems to me, in the 16th century. One was Humphrey Powell, who published the, um, the, the Book of Common Prayer in, 60, in 1551. The other was a Gaelic Irishman, which is very interesting. So William Carney is actually related to um, Sean O'Carna. Again, um, presumably a native speaker of Irish, who seems to have learned, um, learned the printing trade in, in London. Um, so that's the, the first book uh, in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, uh, Protestant Catechism. Um, Carney also worked with another um, Irishman, a Nicholas Walsh, who had also studied at Cambridge uh, and who became Bishop of Ossory in 1578. 
but their efforts to progress the New Testament in Irish um, didn't meet with uh, immediate success. And in fact, it's not until 1602, 1603, that a New Testament um, is published finally in, in Dublin. Uh, and again, uh, you can see here, it's in a Gaelic style script, it's called Queen Elizabeth's uh, Type. And this was printed in folio format, beautiful book by John Frankton, an English printer in Sir William Usher's house uh, at Bridgeford Street uh, in Dublin. It's dedicated to James of uh, the uh, Sixth of Scotland and the First of England. Uh, the dedication was composed sometime after the death of Elizabeth uh, in um, uh, March 1603. And again, we see this very close identification of, 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 of reformation, of Protestantism with, um, with, uh, with, with authority. Inevitably, that's going to be the case as it was a state church. So what do we know about um, William O'Donnell or William Daniel? And the fact that he signs a, a, an Irish introduction, an Irish preface to the reader as Iliam O'Donnell, and he signs the English, the introduction in English is, as William Daniel, gives some sense of, I suppose, the ambiguity of this process. It's, it's Janus, like it's a two-faced view of the world. You somehow have to appeal to an Irish speaking audience as Iliam O'Donnell, and then you say somewhat different things to an English speaking audience as William Daniel. We know he was a Kilkenny native. He was educated at that very influential Puritan college in Cambridge, uh, Emmanuel, which had been recently founded. Graduated um, Cambridge MA 1593, an early scholar and fellow of uh, Trinity, a very early, the first uh, amongst the first generation of scholars there. He was ambitious, I think. Uh, we find him preaching the gospel in Galway in 1590s. Back in Dublin by uh, 1604, where he was treasurer of St. Patrick's. Um, the, the, the translation of the New Testament to Irish is, is a composite affair in that he was assisted by others. Uh, and the printing of the, of, of the New Testament was, um, was started in Trinity in the mid-1590s by William Carney. Uh, and others worked and assisted the translation. Uh, one of them later became the Archbishop of Tume, O'Donnellon. But also, and I think this is where this, this sense of cultural um, buy-in is, is very important to, to, to take into account. Two poets, uh, MacBruyde and O'Higgin, possibly from the west of Ireland, certainly in the case of Donal O'Higgin, assisted with the translation. And um, I think we need to, uh, to acknowledge that poets were, were, were important cultural figures in the sense that uh, they presided over an elite literary register of Irish called Classical Irish, and perhaps um, they were the academics, they were the um, linguistics professors, the English language professors of, of their time in the sense that um, they were most au fait uh, with, uh, written, uh, with the written language and, and a written language which had a, an intellectual currency across the Gaelic realm. So there are local dialects of Irish, but there is this written form of uh, Irish, rather like classical Arabic today, which, um, which is accessible to um, an educated cohort. Uh, this is the New Testament in Irish. There's the uh, introduction in English the, uh, to the Most High and Mighty Prince James by the grace of God, King of etc, etc. This is a copy from the National Library of Ireland and you'll see that at some point in the um, uh, later 17th century, early 18th century, somebody must have ripped out the leaves and some a scribe has very, very carefully written on the right hand side there, um, has, has reproduced the text in script. So you have this mirror image of print and script, of, of, of print and manuscript. And that's important, I think, because it illustrates the actual uh, complementarity of these media. Uh, there's a, a, an example of the, of, of the printed text from Luke chapter one. Uh, O'Donnell was, was nothing if not industrious. And, you know, I think we need to acknowledge the, the huge achievement in, 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 in printing materials in the Irish language uh, in Dublin. Uh, in the early um, 17th century. Here's the fantastically and beautifully and uh, illustrated um, um, title page of the Book of Common Prayer. So the, the authorized liturgical and devotional text of the established church until quite recently, uh, first authorized in, in, in English in 1549. Now O'Donnell or Daniel traveled to Connacht in 1605 to seek assistance again with the translation. And I think he must have visited the Egan, Egan uh, Bardic family in, in East, um, East Galway. This Irish version is in quarto format, printed in quarto um, uh, format. Uh, a beautiful title page distinguished by ornate mannerist architectural uh, decoration. Uh, really like uh, something from um, Renaissance Italy. 
And the date of publication is 1608 on the title page. And um, it has an epistle uh, dedicatory uh, dated um, October 1609, by which state William uh, was, uh, William O'Donnell was Archbishop of Chum. And there's a copy of, of the text that's in the Pierpont Morgan Library, uh, a copy which was presented to the Lord Deputy, uh, Sir Arthur Chichester, who will be well known to um, an Ulster audience. Um, this book is in, in extremely good and pristine condition in New York. Um, Ilya O'Donnell is, is, is really a forgotten Gaelic Protestant. Um, let's, let's, let's listen to his own voice. And I doubt nothing but that in God's time, the country that doth now generally sit in darkness shall in time see great light to their everlasting comfort. Bear in mind, he's a native speaker of Irish. Uh, and he's, he, it seems to me this is, this, is one of, this is very interesting in the sense that uh, you have a native speaker of Irish now writing in a very high register of English uh, at a very early stage in this prolonged encounter uh, between uh, Gaelic and English cultures. He also says, it pleased your lordship, and he, he seems to have been a, a, a sincere um, believer in reform um, um, and, and Puritan in his, uh, in his inclinations at this period. It pleased your lordship to impose upon myself the burden of translating the Book of Common Prayer, the liturgy of the famous Church of England into the mother tongue to the end. And the mother tongue is Irish, so he's not, um, you know, he's asserting there, there's, there's cultural agency happening there. There's a sense of, we need to respect the, the cultural autonomy of, of Gaelic, uh, of Gaelic uh, Ireland. To the end that the ignorant may, be, may understand how grossly they're abused by their blind malicious guides which bear them in hand that our divine service is nothing else but the service of the devil. He dies in relative obscurity in, um, in, in, in Connacht in 1628 where he uh, ser had served as Archbishop of Chum. Right, now let's turn very quickly to uh, our main focus today, but, you know, by way of giving background to the achievement, to, uh, to the cultural, extraordinary cultural sophistication of William Beadle, it is necessary to understand um, something of, of the lineage of this story. Uh, he was born in Essex um, around 1572. Um, he was deeply influenced by his education at guess where, Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Now, Emmanuel uh, was a Puritan seminary founded in 1584, and he was mentored by um, uh, Lawrence Chatterton, the first college master. And I wonder, did, did Beadle, who'd, uh, you know, who'd grown up in relative obscurity in, 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 in Essex, how English is Essex, did he first come into contact with Gaelic Ireland at Emmanuel, where Ilium O'Donnell, or William da Daniel, entered as a student in 1586? Beadle, as, as uh, will be no surprise given his uh, mastery of Irish, was an excellent linguist, um, Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Ar Arabic, Syriac, Aramaic, all languages were, which were requisite to biblical scholarship. He was elected a fellow of Emmanuel in 1593, uh, ordained to the ministry at Colchester in 1597 and left uh, Cambridge in um, uh, 1602. Um, there was a strong emphasis in Emmanuel on sending its, uh, its scholars it's, uh, it's ordained clergy out into the community to minister to the faithful. And he secured an appointment at Bury St. Edmunds. Now he's recognized for the quality of his teaching at, uh, at, at Bury St. Edmunds. Um, his son, William, later wrote, uh, he had gained a great reverence as well, uh, as well from all that savored of the power of godliness as from the gallants, knights and gentlemen who reverenced him for his impartial grave and holy preaching and conversation and heard him gladly. So, uh, you know, he wasn't, he, he, he wasn't just recognized by those who, who were inclined to piety and godliness. Uh, he also gained an audience amongst those who perhaps uh, might have been uh, more fast living. But he had something that I think that it's important. Um, he had a high degree of pastoral sensitivity, and I think that becomes important later on. He had, a, he had a, res a concern for courtesy and respect in the conduct of religious controversy. And he wrote um, in 1604, in, in the context of a theological dis uh, dispute with a, an English Catholic, I write according to my persuasion, etc., as, uh, as an accuser must, in a, uh, must of necessity, without any um, uh, tooth to any person, with, without any gall to those that are otherwise minded. So he's a man who says, I stand by my beliefs, but I, I don't uh, engage in, 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 in exaggerated or personalized invective. And that's a quote from uh, uh, a tract in, in, in um, Lamp of Palace in London. Now, what sets him apart is um, from all other or from most other English clergymen of his generation is that he spends time in Venice. He spends time in Venice between 1607 and 1610. He goes to La Serenissima. He goes 
And in 1607, he was appointed chaplain to uh, in a very interesting individual called Sir Henry Vutton, the English ambassador to, uh, to the city. And unlike the ambassador, uh, Beetle was, was, uh, was enabled, was, was in a position to roam uh, reasonably freely in, the, in this uh, great Catholic city, but a great Catholic city with, with a large Jewish population, which made it uh, interesting in cultural terms. Now, at this stage, um, Venice was in a somewhat, um, uh, a somewhat ambiguous position vis-a-vis -vis Rome. Um, in regards to question of jurisdiction. The Pope, Paul V, was in a quarrel with the Doge. Uh, the Venetian authorities had arrested two priests in 1606 and tried them in civil courts. And this elicited the uh, uh, antagonism of, of the papacy. Uh, the Pope, with the support of Philip III, a great Catholic monarch of Spain, placed the city under interdict in 1606. And um, a famous um, uh, state theologian called Paolo Sarpi made the case for the city's autonomy. Uh, the city ordered the clergy to ignore this, this ban and expel the Jesuits. So this dispute between uh, Venice and Rome, it, it, it ignited Protestant hopes across Europe for, for the simple reason that if Venice were to, to convert to or to turn to Protestantism, it would have been a, an extraordinary slap in the face uh, for, for Rome. Now, um, Sarpi is a very interesting individual. Beetle got to know him. So we have him talking to Catholic uh, priests at this point, and he's in a very Catholic city, as anybody will know who's been to, uh, if only in terms of architecture and, and, um, and, and um, the decorative arts. Um, Beetle got to know Sarpi and acted as an intermediary between him and Wooten. So I think Venice was a pivotal uh, phase for, it was, a, it was a pivotal place, a city of formation for Beetle. He expanded his cultural and religious um, horizons. He learned Italian with the help of Sarpi. He translated the Common Prayer, again, of, of interest to us, given uh, what happens later in Ireland. Uh, and he composed an English grammar for the Italian priest. Uh, another encounter uh, with uh, the Jewish community, Venice had a famous um, uh, Jewish community, it had a famous um, uh, publishing industry in Hebrew, which is quite interesting. He became friendly with a man called Leon Modena, who was ordained a rabbi in 1609. And he was a very famous Jewish uh, religious scholar. And Leon taught him the oriental pronunciation of the Hebrew tongue. He became friendly with a man called Giovanni Diodati, who had translated the Bible to Italian. And I think significantly, he brought that Italian Bible with him to Dublin and Cavan later. So what you have here is a process of, of cultural encounter, which I think uh, would have been quite uncommon in the context of uh, the early modern, um, uh, early 17th century Church of England clergy. Anyway, he returns after two years to, to England. He's accompanied by an Italian doctor who, um, who had converted to, um, to uh, uh, Protestantism, Jasper Despontine. He married, he settled down. And, and really, uh, it seemed as if a, a life of, um, of uh, quotidian um, uh, routine awaited him. It, it seemed as if um, he would spend the rest of his life in, 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 in obscurity in, in East Anglia. Uh, he became rector of Horinger in Suffolk. Uh, he continued to engage with his Italian experience, uh, producing translations and, uh, and, and so on. Something else was unusual was going to happen in his career, which again singles him out. Um, so first you have Venice, which is quite, um, quite an extraordinary cultural uh, experience uh, and puts him in touch with all sorts of people. So I think it expands his horizons uh, culturally, linguistically, but also at a fundamental human level. Uh, he's, um, he's chosen to become um, uh, Provost of Trinity College Dublin. Um, the picture there, I, I hasten to add, is of the rubrics, the oldest surviving bit of, of Trinity from 1700. Uh, so um, 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 it's not a, a site that, uh, familiar, uh, that would have been familiar. Um, he was informed by the great Church of Ireland scholar James Usher that he was a candidate and uh, sometime Archbishop of Armagh. He was a candidate for provostship. Uh, he was reluctant to leave East Anglia. And um, this will be familiar, I think, to most university administrators. His time at Trinity was, was uh, marred by turmoil and, and dissent. But he shows a capacity for intercultural contact, if I may use a, 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 a modern concept. And he wrote early um, that my endeavour shall be to understand the tongue of this country, which I see, although it be accounted otherwise. So he's picking up on, on, on colonial prejudice. He's a learned and exact language and full of difficulty. I've taken a little Irish boy, a minister's son, of whom I hope to make good use to the purpose when I shall have a little more leisure. He set up a series of lectures and prayers in Irish at, at Trinity, but he doesn't stay in, um, he doesn't stay in um, uh, Trinity all that long. And, and I think this is where the most, uh, um, the most interesting part of his career um, begins. 
Um, now, he, in Trinity, he employed a man called uh, Martha King, who was from a Midlands Bardic family. So again, he knows almost immediately that he needs to make contact. And I, and I think this wouldn't have been something that, that would have been a, a naturally apparent to him, that he needs to, uh, to engage with um, the indigenous cultural elite, the Bardic poets and so on, the, 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 the native literati, if he's going to, um, to have any degree of success with his project. So he says, we brought Mr. King to read in our everyday to those, this is a trinity, that are already chosen to frame them to the right pronunciation and exercise of the language, to which purpose we have gotten a few copies of the Book of Common Prayer, which has been translated by uh, um, O'Donnell, Daniel, and do begin with the catechism, which is therein. I hope this course will not be unfruitful. What's funny about um, uh, Beadle, what's interesting about Beadle is that his, his, um, his language efforts are always undertaken in a, in a, in a communal context, but also in, a, in a, a, a devotional context. He's focused on the written word as a, as a means of, of evangelization, as a means of, of spreading the word. Uh, he provided uh, for the trial translation of Psalms to Irish uh, by Martha King. Yet I do forbear to urge it yet because I hear there is a translation made of the Psalms already in the hands of the late Archbishop of Toome's wife. So he knows that there's a possible translation uh, to be had in uh, West of Ireland. Um, his career in, in, in Trinity, which uh, had, had been marred by administrative uh, antagonism, um, comes to an end when he's um, 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 appointed Bishop Kilmore and Arda by Charles I in 1629. Again, this, this photograph is of the 19th century uh, cathedral at, uh, at Kilmore, a very beautiful place, but again, a site that would not have been familiar for obvious reasons. Beetle. Uh, Beadle and Kilmare, we know a bit about his life there because uh, his son and son-in-law wrote about it and we're told that he was very careful, um, and this is his son writing, that if possible ministers might be placed where the people were who were most Irish who had skill in that tongue. So he immediately sees, he immediately follows through on something that wouldn't have been especially radical in the context of the early stage of the Reformation, that is if you're going to uh, preach the word you need to do it in the vernacular, you need to do it in the language that the people understand, which is in contradistinction to the use of, uh, of Latin uh, 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 for the mass uh, by the Catholic Church. And he, and he quotes um, um, a scripture in the Church of God, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Um, the son tells us, William the Younger, he persisted in his course which he had begun and applied himself for example's sake to the study of Irish, wherein as to reading and writing he had attained a good perfection. Uh, and he says his two great concerns of Kilmore uh, were um, um, building of churches, um, um, church infrastructure in Ulster at this period was in, in a sorry state, uh, and uh, the translation of the Old Testament into the Irish tongue. I realize I'm, I'm using up my uh, allotted time, so I shall, I shall speed this up. Uh, so Beadle is, Again, he's a team worker. He depends on, 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 on a group approach to uh, the question of translation, as, as one might expect for the translation of uh, so complicated um, a series of texts as the Old Testament. Uh, the work of translation was undertaken by this poet, Martha King, and another individual about whom we know very little, uh, James Nangle. Uh, and the, William the Beadle, the younger, talks about how they would um, sit down, they had their entertainment at the bishop's house as long and as often as any comparing and re reviewing work in hand, wherein the bishop always made one and through the skill he'd attained in that language, he contributed not a little to the work. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a communal process of translation. And after the fitting of the copy uh, of the translation for the press, he never rose from the table after dinner and supper till he'd examined a sheet and he compared it with the original Hebrew together with his Italian translation and so on. So there's, um, there's a very interesting process of uh, comparative process of translation, but also this is a, a, a group undertaking, as you might expect, uh, and as was the case, for instance, uh, with the uh, King James Version. Um, Alexander Clogie, um, his son-in-law, says the Bishop of uh, uh, K, Bishop Kilmore, slipped no opportunity of doing them good. His heart's desire and prayer to God for the Irish being the same with the apostles for Israel, that they might be saved. So I think, um, it's important, I think, here to, to acknowledge, too, in a very cynical age, uh, that this was a man of extraordinary uh, sincerity. Um, and if we go on, uh, uh, he wasn't contented to leave the poor Irish in Egyptian darkness. And I think maybe this singles him out from, say, uh, some of the other uh, clergymen he worked with, uh, and, and more broadly in the Church of Ireland, that there was this, uh, and, and I suspect Beadle might have been an awkward character for many of his colleagues in the church. Um, um, he's not a man um, um, who um, easily surrendered 
uh, any uh, notion or, or a belief that he was committed to, or that he felt was in line with his commitment to. Uh, to. Um, his achievements were swept away in Ulster with the outbreak of the 1641 uh, rebellion. Um, uh, his palace uh, at Kilmore's crowded refugees, uh, his evicted uh, Eugene Sweeney, the Catholic equivalent, is installed. They're confined in Clockhoopter Castle. He's taken to the house of a local Gaelic um, clergyman. Interesting, a Gaelic clergyman uh, called Dennis Sheridan. Uh, he dies of, of fever. Um, but um, affectingly, um, the local Gaelic aristocratic family, the local Gaelic elite family, lordly family, seigneurial family, uh, the O'Reillys uh, provided a, a military escort for his uh, entourage. Um, maybe um, I was, because I'm running out of time, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about, about a man called John Elliot, uh, who was called the Apostle to the Indians. Uh, and again, he comes from um, um, a modest yeoman uh, background. He goes to New England uh, and he undertakes um, a whole process of translation to Algonquin, uh, the local indigenous uh, language. Uh, he, with rather more success, uh, it has to be admitted, than, than any equivalent in the Church of Ireland, um, Eliot uh, produced an Indian library of texts in Massachusetts, 20 different titles uh, printed between 1654 and 1688. And if you think the, the production of, um, of, 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 of materials, printing materials in, in, in Dublin was, was a challenge in the 16th century, it was uh, much more so uh, in uh, the New World, where there is no uh, printing press uh, down until the installation of one in, in Harvard College. Uh, he starts with an Indian primer, a catechism in 1654, and a Massachusetts Bible in 1663. So when is the Bible, the full Bible, published in Irish? Um, uh, what, the Old Testament that uh, Beadle had worked on was, uh, was saved, fortuitously, uh, providentially, depending on how you might view these things, by a man called Henry Jones. Uh, and the, the republication of the, old, the, old, the New Testament, of uh, Daniel's New Testament, 1681, and Beadle's Old Testament, in uh, so it's not been published, it's in manuscript format. It's finally published in 1685, uh, thanks to funding from uh, a scholar and scientist called uh, Robert Boyle, who was son of the first Earl of uh, Cork. Boyle saw evangelization uh, on, on, on a global scale, and he was involved with efforts to evangelize in places like New England. Um, he provided support for a Turkish New Testament. Uh, he was committed to uh, evangelization in Southeast Asia through his involvement with the East India Company. And interestingly, he also supported the transliteration of the Irish Bible into Roman characters. So going back to the first publication in Scottish Gaelic or Gaelic um, in, in, in Roman characters, um, its appearance in, in Gaelic characters meant that it was much less legible and much less accessible to a wide audience in Gaelic Scotland. So he had it transliterated uh, with the assistance of a man called Robert Kirk, a minister. And 3,000 copies were printed in London in 1690 for a Gaelic speaking audience, uh, Gaelic speakers, Gaelic readers, readers of Scottish Gaelic in. in, um, in um. So there's the, the, the final um, um, uh, Old Testament of uh, Dr. William Biddell, Beadle. Uh, this is a plaque that you'll find uh, at uh, that wonderful, uh, wonderfully. Um, Wonderfully atmospheric place, Kilmore, and in thankful remembrance of William Beadle, uh, who has been laid to rest there. He's called Optimus Anglorum there, the best of the English. And in other places you'll find it, Optimus Anglorum. And I'm not quite certain, is it a pun on the best or the last of the English? Um, Aidan Clark, uh, who died recently, the late Aidan Clark, um, wrote a, an essay on Beadle, uh, which was published in 1989, and said he was a loser. It was a, a series of essays that was entitled Losers in Irish History. And at first glance, yes, I suppose um, uh, the Reformation um, didn't take off, if I can put it very um, uh, approximately. Um, it, it, it foundered, um, there was no process of mass Reformation. But I wonder, was Beadle a winner in the long term? I think in terms of his cultural sophistication, his global outlook, I think Beadle is a very modern figure. And I don't think he's a loser at all, actually. I think he's somebody who's extraordinarily successful. Um, um, there is a counter response from the Catholic Church. Again, I'm running out of time. So, um, 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 a native Irish um, poet from Fermanagh called Ohosa becomes a Franciscan. He goes to uh, Leuven. There's an Irish college established there by the Franciscans. And it becomes a center of printing, a counter Reformation center of printing. And the first Catholic Christian doctrine is quite some time after, um, after 
uh, the Protestant publications appear, and it's 1611. So quite some time has elapsed before um, there is a counter program of print in Irish. Um, the Bible, the Irish Bible had a long life. Um, here's a description of, uh, from a man called Reverend John Graham, um, a clergyman in Mahara in Derry in 1814. And he says they procured a few copies of Archbishop, Archbishop Daniel's Irish Testament, so the New Testament. But he says they were on, on sale in shops in Mahara, but none of them were bought because the inhabitants found it uh, difficult to read them. And I wondered, I suspect that's not a question just of dialect. I think that's, that's, that's down to the fact that they probably just weren't able to read Irish well. Because we find uh, around the same time a, 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 a report uh, on a group in Cork uh, who had come under the influence of uh, Tadeus Connellan, an, an Irish-born scholar, Protestant convert who worked for the Irish Society. And um, he believed that if you um, uh, taught people to, um, to, to, to read in Irish first, that this would enable them to learn to read more quickly in, in English. So again, this, this very interesting uh, dual uh, cultural approach. But he talks about, uh, in the minutes of the Irish Society, is a description of uh, a group in Cork um, and who were anxious to obtain possession of the scriptures in Irish was such, such was their uh, um, um, desire to, to, to possess the scriptures that they presented a memorial to the Bishop of Cork they give them a temporary loan, the Church of Ireland bishop, of a copy of Bishop Bidell's Bible, which was deposited in the library of his cathedral, and that having obtained permission from his lordship to read or copy it on Sundays, 12 of the memorialists are now engaged every Sunday in the transcription of it, after which the portion copied is read aloud for the information and gratification of the whole body. So this is a very interesting um, indication of just how um, a printed copy uh, now serves as the exemplar of the source text um, for written copies, it inverts this process of, of going from manuscript to print, but it also shows this neat, um, this neat nexus of orality, print and script. So uh, it's a very complicated um, ecology, I would call it, a communication. And I was struck by this uh, reading a, a review recently on Samizdat. Uh, these are manually typed texts which circulated in the Soviet Union texts that were frowned upon or banned by the authorities. And the famous Russian poet Anna Akhmatova uh, she called Samistat a pre-Gutenberg medium, but um, the reviewer says no, and they're, 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 the, the Samistat was, was less of a throwback, more than a creative variant of the modern literary ecosystem, and he describes it there. And I think that system um, is not just modern, it could also be early modern if you uh, put in um, uh, listeners. All right, just so by way of conclusion, I, I suppose what I wanted to say in this, I think it is culturally fascinating and, and very modern story, uh, of, of conflict, but also accommodation and of mutual understanding is that um, this lovely phrase from uh, that lovely novel by uh, Penelope Lively, Moon Tiger, the voice of history, of course, is composite. Many voices, all the voices have managed to get themselves heard, some louder than others, naturally. And I wonder, um, maybe Beadle's voice wasn't heard loudly in the, uh, in the 17th century, but I think um, what he has to say to us today uh, needs to be heard loudly. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a complex and, 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 and a, very interesting, um, it's a very interesting take on how cultures can come together and how they can mutually, I suppose, enrich each other. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, there was no Catholic Bible uh, until the 1980s, no, no fully uh, readily available um, uh, whole Bible. And uh, when Latin was replaced by the vernacular during the uh, Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, guess what? Beadle's Old Testament was used for daily mass in the Gueltox areas. Now, perhaps uh, Beadle mightn't have uh, been wholly pleased with that outcome, uh, but nonetheless, I think it's a testament to um, his modernity in ways. I don't want to be anachronistic and read back our values, uh, but there is, um, uh, Beadle seems to me to be uh, an exemplar for cultural, uh, and pastoral empathy. Thank you very much. And um, there's more information if, uh, if you're so minded to follow up on this.